Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Customer Acquisition Show. I am your host, Tom Merritt, the VP of Marketing here at Tier 11. And today we have another crossover episode with our sister podcast, Perpetual Traffic. Hosts Ralph and Cosm go deep into a subject that we've been talking a lot about here on the Customer Acquisition Show and at Tier 11 in general with our clients, the idea of full funnel marketing excellence. Traditionally in digital marketing, it's been easy to go straight to the conversion events, the bottom of the funnel. But as things become more competitive, there's a a big need to grow your audience by expanding your funnel and utilizing brand awareness. They go deep into a Bennett and Field study, the experts in this space, and show how to make the transition from the sawtooth of conversion, 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 conversion to the long-term growth utilizing brand building. So without further ado, here's Ralph and Cosm and Perpetual Traffic. Hello and welcome to the Perpetual Traffic Podcast. This is your host, Ralph Burns, and this is the show where we share cutting edge strategies and acquiring leads and sales to acquire more customers for your business. And today we're going to be talking about the new strategy, Kasim, the next era of growth, which is called Full Funnel Excellence. That was a great so, title, by the way, Full Funnel Excellence. Well, you know, you thought of it actually before we hit record. So I think I'm you just gonna... wrote it and I just said, hey, good title. That's 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 why this whole thing works. Yeah. It really does. Speaking of working, you've been working. Uh, you were in LA last week at the Driven Mastermind, which is up to what, like 60, 60 members, everybody like super smart. We've had Jason Fladlin on the show, obviously Molly Pittman. You, I guess we can lump in, in that category, considering all the books in your background. Low man on the totem pole. Low man on the totem pole. Good to be the dumbest guy in the room. So that's, that's the room you want. <laughs> that's the room you want. <laughs> So coming from the Driven Mastermind, which was what? A two-day event in LA this time. Yeah, we change and the locations every quarter, but we meet. We, it's actually a weekly mastermind. We meet every week, uh, Wednesday for 90 minutes virtually, and then we get together in person every quarter. Cool. Yeah. It's pretty awesome. And then you got another one coming up in Mexico, which Cancun. I... Uh, yeah, I'm... I'm I'm planning on crashing that party. You should cut that. that that's a, so for the perpetual traffic listener. If you want to meet Ralph, come oh, pay wow. me money to be a part of my <laughs> mastermind, and then and then you can hang out with Ralph for as long as you want in Cancun. He'll oh, be doing book signings, meet and greets. I almost met my wife in Cancun. Did I ever tell you the story? No. <laughs> I met a woman from Mexico in my twenties, and I was ring shopping, like. Uh, well, no, no, no. I met her in Cancun and then we started dating and I got so close. I was actually at the ring shopping stage, which my kids to this day still give me crap about because I've told this story a hundred times to them and they always laugh. But yeah, we met, we met in a club in Cancun. So I don't think I've been back since then. Custom. Like an Owen uh, Wilson movie. Now you're going to go back and you're going to find her you know, <laughs> 20 years later and you guys have to catch up and there's some serendipitous thing. And Not not with my wife. She, she'd uh, see this head. She doesn't like it, Owen Wilson movies. It, it would be chopped off and she doesn't like uh, Owen Wilson at all. All right. Uh, yeah. She, well, I would yeah. be the Vince Vaughn in the movie, just <laughs> for the record. <laughs> like the really tall way too loud guy that gets you in trouble so. yeah he gets off scot-free yeah yeah uh so yeah so there's another one coming up when is that one in uh, case October, people are interested 16 17 and 18 all right now, how could they actually go and like check it out um do you have a, do you have a call could... to action here seeing how we're pitching 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 yeah drivenmastermind.com um it's 25 grand a year to join you have to be a seven-figure business uh we're keeping it small we're going to limit it to 100 members we're more than halfway we should be at 100 by the end of the year so if you're looking for home you know if you're looking for a community a family of a, uh, a group of entrepreneurs that um you know we, we all really do it this is it's 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 a group of real very real tacticians, people that actually do it on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so you can apply at drivenmastermind.com. And um, yeah, we'd love to have some like-minded folks in there. If if things like typos offend you or, you know, you complain about the temperature of the eggs served at the morning for breakfast, like don't apply, leave us alone. But if you're, if you're one of those people that like stays up at night thinking about how you're going to make a hundred million dollars, you know, like if you want to be Scrooge McDuck swimming in a, in a sea of cash, because we're unapologetically about just growth, money, power, all the things that you're supposed to be apologetic about nowadays. Mm -hmm. So, you know, hopefully that repels and attracts the right people there. 
That's my perfect. that's my sales pitch. <laughs> that's perfect. If you want to be awash in a sea of cash and you got a million dollar plus business, this is the place. Come to Driven and, Mastermind. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, I'll tell you, like masterminds. Maybe this is our nugget for the day because I know you've got a nugget. So you just came from there. But another nugget is join a mastermind for crying out loud. If you oh, are dude, any mastermind, it's the it, highest yeah. ROI I've ever had. Oh, absolutely. So if you're a you know, there's masterminds for CMOs. There's masterminds for CFOs. There's masterminds for COOs. There's masterminds yeah. for CEOs. Has a mastermind for COOs. We sh we should have him on the show. Dude, My COO yeah. has yeah, he's a super sharp guy. Yeah. Guy you know that who else we should have is Joe Polish. He has a great mastermind, Genius Network. Uh, absolutely, we should. I love Joe. Um, yeah, so the, I think masterminds just in general are a great thing. They are typically not cheap. I know Joe's mastermind is not cheap. Driven isn't cheap. Dude, the, everybody's um, Cameron Harold. I don't think. Grand. Yeah, it's in that range. Yeah, I mean, some but, of them go higher, but you know, you, you have to spend about twenty five grand a year to be in a in a good mastermind. Although Steve Sims, who's my buddy and also in Driven, he's launching a downstream mastermind for up and coming entrepreneurs. It's like ten grand a year or something. It might even be less than that. So maybe we'll have wow. Steve on the show. Has he been, he's been on perpetual traffic before. He has, yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. We'll leave uh, we'll leave links in the show notes back to to Steve's uh, Steve's episode. But yeah, definitely check all that out. We'll leave links in the show notes for that. I should get an affiliate link. I think for Trevor. You, you should. Yeah. You know, Perry needs to pay me. I think after me paying him for so many years because right. I was part of War Room and then I left because it kind of got sucky and then you joined and then it got better. And then I was like, hmm, because you joined. And I was like, hmm, maybe I should join again. And then they broke it apart. <laughs> so <laughs> that's my whole story. But the, the evolution of this podcast actually happened from a mastermind. Did you know that? I do. I, well, I think you should tell the story. I think everybody should know that if we're pitching masterminds. All right. If we're pitching, like we're going on and on about masterminds, but that's how important they are. So I was in a mastermind seven or eight years ago. I mean, maybe it was, let's see, maybe it was close to nine years ago. And this is headed by Ryan Dice was called War Room, no longer exists, but now it's sort of broken up. They have their own mastermind. By the way, Ryan Dice is coming back on perpetual traffic very <gasps> shortly, which is pretty cool. Prodigal so, Sun returns. Yeah, but you guys are like mortal enemies now with competing masterminds. I still so love is, him dearly. It's going to be fun. Yeah. Yeah. No, he's awesome. I don't think you, yeah. I, like it's funny because I've always been such a fanboy of Ryan and I just know yeah. that I'm the guy that annoys him. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I'm the guy, I don't know if, if you've seen Robin Hood Men in Tights, but like when the abbot's walking down the hallway and there's the guy that loves him, he's like, hey, abbot. And the abbot goes, I hate that guy. Like, I feel like that's me. <laughs> I'm always, I always know, like I have his phone number and I'll call him occasionally, but I'll text him every once in a while. I'm like, is he going to respond? Yeah. And like, it takes like days sometimes. And he's like, hey, sorry, dude. I was in taking a four week vacation in Europe. And I'm like, oh, he still likes me. Yeah. You know, I still have that thing. It's like very strange. Um, but anyway, so, but one of the most brilliant marketers ever to uh, walk the planet. So he's coming back for that. Perry Belcher is pretty freaking smart himself is the one that runs Driven. But so Ryan was on stage at War Room uh, when I, <laughs> I, I cut a check for 10 grand to join uh, when I had 11 grand in my checking account. And I don't know as if we were quite a million dollar business yet, but that was the cutoff. But I was interviewed by other people and in the mastermind, they're like, yeah, the guy seems cool. Seems like he has enough money to make the payments. Uh, so that's how I joined. But at the second show or at the second uh, one, I remember it was at the Montage in Beverly Hills, which was like, this was like the nicest hotel I've ever been in. I, I mean, I was Courtyard by Marriott was about as high as I would go at that point on my mm -hmm. budget which was really nice. And only the first point. floor. Like <laughs> <laughs> only the first floor. All right, the handicap unit. That's right. And so we're in this hall and he's like, hey, you know, anybody here, it was a like hundred business owners. Like anybody here run a podcast? And like one guy raised his hand and Ryan goes, I'd like to do a podcast someday. And I was like, hmm. So I texted my then partner and then I texted Molly Pittman, who I did know, and I said, hey, Ryan says he wants to start a podcast. Maybe we should put, start a podcast together. And so I literally, at the break, walked up to him after my then partner and Molly said, yeah, let's do it. It would be the three of us. I walked up to Ryan. I said, hey, you mentioned like you want to do a podcast. Do you want to do a podcast? He's like, yeah. It's like, I, 
I don't have to be on it though, right? It was like, oh no, 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 we do it for you. And he's like, okay, great. I got a great person for you, Molly Pittman. I was like, I've already asked her and she said yes. She's like, I have no authority in this company <laughs> whatsoever, which was always sort of funny. But anyway, so we started the show literally like a month after that. So it started from a mastermind. So there's your nugget today on masterminds. Well, Join the one. Traffic was the, uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, Ralph, but I've heard enough of the story. I mean, that was the seminal moment for tier 11, right? Oh. Like that oh, really yeah. put y'all on the map and it was responsible for so many other introductions and opportunities. And hundred percent. Yeah. hundred percent. I mean, we were doing pretty well before that. We had a really good relationship with some, you know, some, some of the biggest gurus in the space at that point, like Jack Canfield and Perry Marshall and a bunch of others. We ended up doing ads for pretty much anybody and everybody that you know that was in an internet marketing guru at that point in time, including, you know, Dice and Perry Belcher. Like we ran ads for Perry and his businesses for a year plus. Hmm. Uh, so anyway, so, but it all started from a mastermind. So we are big believers in masterminds. Uh, so definitely check that one out. We'll leave links in the show notes for that. Coming back to our nugget, before we get into our episode, what was the big nugget you learned out in LA at Driven? Well, there's a hundred million of them, but here's the one that I'm going to pull out because it was, uh, it was, it's the most immediately actionable. We do a session okay. called Tool Time, which is really fun because you know there's a hundred some odd entrepreneurs in the room and, and it takes hours, if not days, if not weeks to figure out what software you're going to use for specific things, right? Like when you're right. really going to school on it or even stumbling upon software, it's hard to know what works and what doesn't. And so we crowdsource it and we just ask everybody to submit the tools that they love the most. And we, we got at least over a hundred, Ralph, the list is extensive, but the one that I'm really excited about is called chatbase.co, chatbase.co. Hmm. And what it does is it allows you to build a chatbot based off of your own proprietary data. So, so cool. You add it to your website, for instance. It crawls your website. And then now people can ask the chatbot questions based off of all the content on your website. And the more content robust your website is, obviously, the better the chat base works. And so they can, you know, I mean, you're answering questions about products, services, terms, um, materials, uh, shipping, receiving. Um, and it's, it's unbelievably effective. And what's really cool about it too is it's iterative. So if somebody, you know, if it, it says something that you don't like or makes a mistake, you get to see every single chat that takes place. You get to correct anything that it says incorrectly. And then from that point on, it will always uh, respond perfectly. And so if you've got a content rich website, um, this, is, this is an absolute necessity. I especially love it for e-commerce and SaaS. Because yeah. if you have a content rich website and e-com and SaaS, what, the thing that's really, you know, obvious, but maybe not so obvious about those things is the transaction actually takes place on site. There's no call, book appointment, schedule. It's like, they're going to buy right now today. And if you can put an AI-driven chatbot that's preloaded with all of the information about your specific product, like, oh my goodness, you know, and you just make it easier for them to find than having to sift through things. So I'm not an affiliate. Uh, one of our members, I wish I could tell you which member came up with it because um, I should really, really give them a shout out. Uh, oh, you know what? I think it was Rachel. So shout out to Rachel. Um, and I might be wrong about that. So now I'm now I'm nervous, Ralph. But chatbase.co, um, potentially from Rachel Perlmutter, uh, pretty amazing little tool. And it's one of those examples of how like AI doesn't usurp or change the world. But it, it's, it's just a, you know, 1% improvement here. And then another tool will give you another 1% improvement. That, those compound effects are going to put you massively ahead of your competition. Yeah. No, that's huge. That's huge. The, <clears throat> the other tool that's in this space that I'm aware of but have not used and put this on a list of things to test now that I have chatbase.co. It's chatbase.co, correct? Yep, .co. Is uh, myaskai.com. Does a similar thing? Um, and I've heard really, really good things about this through sort of secondary sources, but this is the future. Mm -hmm. I mean, this, especially on e -com, if you're not testing out these types of things at the, at the very least, like, oh my God, 
like the the ability to be able to sort of upload your entire database of information, especially if you have a content rich site, which I know a lot of people listening to this show are big believers in content. Well, dude, I think the more content, content the rich site, there's an AI solution for that too. But you you right. have to now. You have to be yeah. content rich. Do you, you know what I love about my ask? I'm on, I'm on it now. Mm-hmm. I'm on myaskai.com. Uh, it, it allows you to upload documents. It says upload a PDF text or doc file, and then you can chat with any document. And I, I, I dropped this as a nugget on a previous episode. I do this with legal documents. I did this two days ago. Yeah. I'm buying a, an apartment building in Fargo, and I uploaded this document. And I started asking questions. What are the terms of the agreement? Is there anything here that I should be worried about? Is there anything that makes the seller, you know, puts the seller at risk? And it is insane how well it works. And I wasn't even using this tool. I actually use a, a separate tool that looks to be maybe not quite as effective as this one. So, um, so cool, man. It just blows yeah. me away that we're here. Like this feels, I'm just such an old guy. This feels like Star Trek, you know, yeah. like you're chatting with a PDF document. Oh, it's, it's, it's crazy to think about. And it's crazy to think about like, this is just the tip of the tip of the tip of the iceberg. Oh, yeah. You know, it, people are like, oh my God, chat GPT, AI. Wow, that's amazing. And then they sort of stop and that's it. Like, no. Like, first off, <laughs> there's not going to be any other public tools released by OpenAI uh, in the future, according to Sam Altman. The point is, is like, that well, just can got you blame people. the guy? He got what, like, why dragged would over hot coals and crucified by the angry mob. And he's like, all right. We won't let you see what we're doing. You know, right. it's not, oh, gosh, man, we just ruined everything. I know. You know, the guy was trying to be open, transparent, honest. He was trying to allow for some level of like public influence and public opinion. Yeah. And instead, we just like straight up farmer and pitchforked him. It, it, it's, it's incredible. And then when you have a conversation with a non- with a non-marketing person, it always goes to fear-based like, oh my God, they're taking over. It's like, oh my God. I, I, it's almost like one of those conversations that you don't want to have. Yeah. Because when I talk about AI, I talk about it like this is transformational, at least for my business, business in general, certainly on the marketing side. Uh, and people just immediately go to this fear based thing. And that I think that all of that, you know, backlash that Sam Altman got is it's too bad. It really it's too is. Bad. I, I, I really he, like him. I think he's the exact so right I, guy for that role. I think so too. And I think he's got his intentions in the right place, going to the government, looking to, you know, get regulation, like all these sorts of things. I don't know. He seems like one of the good guys, hopefully. I used yeah. to think that. So about let's him. punish him. No good deed yeah. goes unpunished. Exactly. Just, That's know. what we do. Right. <laughs> oh, get you're out. being honest about what you're doing. I'm going to stab you in the heart. And then everybody, you know, every other company is building it all in the background and they're doing it in the, the fastest, cheapest, most dangerous way possible. And, and we reward that. Yeah. Yeah. It's unfortunate. But anyway, the tools that are there right now, we'll leave links in the show notes over perpetualtraffic.com. Make sure that you go watch us. Watch us on YouTube. We're we're almost real time here with these episodes. I'm pretty excited about this. And you just reminded me that we also are distributing perpetual traffic episodes and shorts and mids, I think they're called. Uh, over on Solutions 8. So check out the Solutions 8 YouTube channel. You guys are doing that as well. Uh, but yeah, like this episode, when it is released, it should be released on YouTube at the exact same moment. We, we've we been trying to get to that point. Thank you, Tier 11 marketing team, yeah. for finally getting your shit together to be able to do it. Um, perpetualtraffic.com forward slash YouTube. We'll uh, obviously leave links in the show notes, but that's pretty self-explanatory. Perpetualtraffic.com forward slash YouTube. We are going to get into today's conversation about the next era of growth, full funnel excellence, right after this quick break. All right, so we are back. Today we're talking about full funnel. And this is an offshoot of the explanation I had on the the Meta Performance Marketing Summit. 
out in San Francisco, which there was a lot of revelations that were out there, I think for me. And I think it was a, it was a, a different way of looking at what we are doing currently when it comes to media buying. And little did I know that we were actually doing a lot of it already. I don't think the team really realized how, how impactful it was for individual customers. And what I'm really talking about here is the over-reliance on the website conversion type of campaign when it comes to meta. Mm. And this does relate, a lot of this does relate back to pay-per-click advertising, Google, uh, you know, uh, high intent based keywords, a lot of that. And then how blending that with performance max, for example, is sort of the way of the future. What we are seeing now is that, and in meta did a, a, a pretty good presentation on this. I'm sort of going to bring it back down to like the level that, okay, this isn't just for enterprise level businesses to do, which is starting off with sort of a three tiered uh, way in which to approach cold traffic, to bring them into your funnel, which they call full funnel. And it's not just website conversion campaigns. It's not just high value or high intent you know, in the PI lawyer space, car accident attorney, Albuquerque, New Mexico keywords. Like those are conversion campaigns, high intent, people who are looking for something and are very easy to convert, but there's only so much volume. And what the big brands have found is that when they start to combine three different types of campaigns together, it not only powers the conversion campaigns more effectively, but it also expands the market. Mm. And then they can finally reach scale. Isn't that and interesting so, dude, that you can, and that's something that I think we as marketers don't acknowledge, at least small business marketers don't acknowledge often enough. You can create a market. Like big businesses do this all the time. Apple did this. Apple created a market that didn't exist. You know, I mean, Apple sold more in AirPods than Twitter's gross revenue, Netflix's gross revenue, like, you know, unbelievable. And I'm, I might be misquoting that, but I'm getting the gist right. And before that, there was no market for AirPods. Like people spent $10 on headphones, 30 if you were insane, $200 if you were a Dr. Dre fan. Nobody, but and dude, now everybody has True. to, you can create a market and we just need to acknowledge our power there. Sorry to interrupt. No, 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 absolutely. And that's, that's, you're a very good interrupter, by the way. Thanks, Ralph. Yeah. Yeah. It's a skill I've been cultivating since childhood. (laughs) No, I think it's, uh, no, you're absolutely right. And I think that's how you have to think. You're like, oh, well, you know, I'm a director of marketing. I'm a, I'm a business owner. I'm not an Apple. Mm. Well, I beg to differ. Actually, I think you can learn lessons from the apples of the world, from the athletic greens of the world, from the Sephora's of the world, from you know some of the examples that that Meta used were major brands like Allergan, which has Botox, and you know a couple of other brands. Like these big brands are doing something right. Yeah, and look at they're what not Blue just. Did. Do you know who Blue Apron is? I do. That nobody, are you, here's the thing that pisses me off about Blue Apron. I understand when you send me meals, like freshly send you cooked meals and then I take them out and I put them in the microwave or I put it on the stove and then I get to eat that meal. Blue <laughs> Apron sends me the ingredients to a meal that I then have to cook. <laughs> it's like, you do the hard work. We'll do the easy, you know, the easiest part of this whole thing, like going to the store and putting it all in a bag. Yeah, we're going to do that part and we're going to sell it to you. But they they blew up, they exploded, and they turned it into a date night, and it's this big, you know, they're, they're USPs, and it's specific for people who like to cook. But it's it's such a it's such a phenomenal example of a business and a market that didn't exist until they created it. They created the problem, and then they solved it. Yeah, yeah, uh, the, the, you know, it's a category king. Yeah, and as a great book. Oh man, I'm gonna forget the name of the book. But anyway, Google category king the book. And we'll leave links in the show notes on this. And it's exactly, I think it's bigger. Oh man, I forget the name of the book. Play though, but bigger. Anyway. Play bigger. Yeah. That's it. It's exactly all about this. How do you do it? You create your market. Mm. You create, you know, your own blue apron. And I'm not saying go out there, you know, maybe maybe your first time in doing this, but you know, you should have some at least some experience. Uh, my 
my point is, is like a lot of these businesses that they talk about and play bigger, uh, yeah, had previous experience in business and were really, really knew what they were doing. Salesforce is a great example of that. Uh, you know, obviously Apple is a great example of that. Blue Apron is an example of that. They use a lot of different examples. It's a great book. Uh, I've had my team read it. We've talked about it. How do you actually do it though? This is sort of the advertising and getting the word out there part of it. So this mm -hmm. is sort of an inflection point and a big opportunity in the market right now that we are seeing. And then we're also seeing for our individual customers that were testing this with not even, I wouldn't even say testing it with custom. We've been doing it for like over a year now and it's absolutely taking things from hundreds of thousands of dollars in ad spend to millions of dollars per month in ad spend by doing this very thing, which we're going to get into in just a second. But, um, I should say that uh, for us, we, you know, we do have a, a download of this and a, a lead magnet that you can get over at tier11.com forward slash uh, brand building. That's tier11.com forward slash brand building. We'll leave that link in the show notes as well. I'll actually show you a case study where we actually did this exact thing. Let's get into it. So we've reached uh, an interesting point right now. So we've got the economy that's under pressure. I know you think the sky is falling. Uh, I don't think the sky is falling. Probably will fall sometime in 2025, though, <laughs> the way that things are looking. Uh, economy is under pressure. The ad ecosystem is changing. Policies, you've got privacy, you've got new platforms that are coming out that involve a hell of a lot of AI, a lot of machine learning. There's less for media buyers technically to do. So the ad ecosystem is definitely evolving. And then there's an opportunity here uh, to increase focus on value and like marketing budgets, especially now because maybe the economy is under pressure, marketing budgets are definitely under the microscope. So what we're seeing is a reallocation or sort of a shift in spend from pure bloody red ocean conversion ads to top of funnel brand awareness, consideration and awareness types of ads and blending the two together. And that's really what this is all about. And Meta calls it full funnel, not necessarily in love with that term, but I think it is a big, uh, it, it, it's one of the biggest things I think in in media buying that we've experienced in the last year. We didn't even realize we were doing it, mm. custom, which is crazy. So, what happens you love though that when you catch yourself doing something right? And you're like, yeah, oh. like, huh. how smart I am. Well, that actually makes sense. Yeah. Jeez, maybe I you should know? do this for a living. Right. You know what? I mean, we have so many accounts that we deal with. Like this was happening in accounts I didn't even realize it was happening. Like the media buyers were doing it on their own. Yeah. The dude, Which that's, is even that, better. The thing about best practices, they're generally intuitive, right? Like it's generally the thing that somebody who does it for a long enough period of time would, would naturally default to. And it's only like bureaucracy and uh, micromanagement that veers them off of course. So because y'all are strategist led, which is the right way an agency should be led, by the way, you end up with natural best practices. And then this is the thing that always pisses me off. The, then somebody else comes along and just defines it better. And right. they get to look like they invented it. And I'm like, I've been doing this the whole time, but you named it and came up with the graphic. And so now all of a sudden you you own this shit and I have yeah. to pretend like we follow you. But yeah, I, I, I think that that's an important note, uh, especially for CMOs and director of marketing. If you're not strategist led in an ecosystem like this, you're going to get into a lot of trouble because the people doing the work should be the ones making those very specific decisions. Yeah. Um, it's and, and hopefully this example lands properly, but I have some family that are in the U.S. Special Forces, and they talk very often about um, leadership from the front. Like if you're in, if you're actually your feet on the ground, you should be the one making the calls, not whoever's in the, you know, air conditioned bunker looking at satellite photos because they just don't see it. And, and very often that's how businesses are run. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I a hundred percent agree. And I think, you know, we talked about one of these case studies well, uh, with Kobe uh, the last time he was on the show and this was actually it. And that's when I kind of pieced it together. I was like, well, I went to this conference and I, and I said, fundamentally, this makes sense. 
but where are we actually using it? And then I went back and I looked and I was like, oh my God, we're already doing it, which is great. And then my job is then to, you know, celebrate the, the innovation at that like forward facing level, like the one, the people that are in the trenches, you know, they're out in the field, they're doing the work every single day. They're trying to figure out ways to scale and grow clients and looking for alternate ways to do it. They stumbled on this without really realizing it was a thing. Mm. You know what I mean? And, and then it's my job as the CEO to say, okay, look at what our team has done. I'm going to label it and package it and put it together in this presentation, which is basically what I did before the entire group last week. I said, guys, this isn't like a big shift. We're already doing it. I'm just labeling it full funnel or meta is labeling it full funnel. Right. And what it really is, is this flywheel effect that you're seeing on the screen here. And, you know, if you're listening to this, I would highly encourage you to go over to perpetualtraffic.com forward slash YouTube, watch the YouTube video on this, because this is, this is important stuff. This is where the puck is headed. If you're not doing it, uh, you're going to be left behind and you're also going to be paying a ton of money for your ads in a very competitive, bloody red ocean. Uh, another great book, Blue Ocean, Red Ocean, um, that... You're just not going to be able to scale. And that's why our media buyers started to figure this out. They're like, they reached this point where conversion ads, we already hit all the people that were ready to convert or in that moment of truth, potentially. Now, this can be related back to Google pay-per-click with high intent-based keywords. There's always a constant you know, flow of new people that will go into that audience. But as the next graphic shows, you won't really be able to scale. You'll reach a certain point where you, you have a ceiling, you know, no matter how great you are, no matter if you're John Moran or, you know, you're anybody on our team, or you're still, you're just starting out on Google ads, you will reach a ceiling in that market. And you reach a ceiling inside Facebook and Meta just using conversion ads. So what we're talking about here is this flywheel effect where you use awareness, you use consideration, you use conversion, which then creates sort of this equity brand love advocate. And it's a virtuous cycle. It's a, mm. it's a true fly, flywheel that then brand fuels the performance. And as an example of a customer right now that we'll, we'll sort of talk about here in today's presentation that understands this fundamentally and, and hired us specifically for this once they got other, other ads sort of optimized and in the right spot. Does that make sense so far? Yeah, I love the, the line, brand fuels performance. That to me, it, there's, there's a lot that's being said there. It's the type of thing that you'd want to print out and put up on your wall if you're a CMO. Brand fuels performance because it means that you need to be approaching things brand first. And that doesn't mean branding. Mm -hmm. You know, there's like just big, big differences there. But if you're trying to adopt a single paradigm, that would be my battle cry just in, in this particular instance. Brand fuels performance. Did you make that up or is that Meta's? Uh, I would like to say I made it up. Dude, patent but... pending. Ralph Burns. Hashtag I, TM. I... <laughs> My, and my admin put the slides together. I think she actually <laughs> took it from Meta. Dude, I take I take credit for everything my EA has ever done. If my <laughs> EA does something in my mind, I did it. Um, I'd like I'd like more, to I'd like to think she thought of it. I, I have a feeling he actually took it from Meta, but that's all right. Brand fuels performance. You like it? It's a it's a good tagline. It's a good rallying cry. Yeah. And so this is uh, we're gonna get a little academic here. So we're going to get into like, the why watching, behind If this. you're listening, go to YouTube because this is very visual, the slides that Ralph is sharing. Yeah. So there is a study that the, I, I you know, give credit where credit's due. Uh, you know, one of our directors of performance actually found this study and sent it to me before I went to the Meta Performance Summit. So he had already read it. Hmm. It was already sort of thinking this way. And then I didn't realize that one of our other growth strategists uh, had already read this study as well. So this is sort of a landmark study. We refer to breakthrough advertising with Eugene Schwartz all the time, like I think on pretty much every single podcast. This might be one of those studies that we refer back to all the time. And it's from Les Bennett and Peter Field. And we'll actually, we'll leave links to it in the show notes. It is very long. It's a very long academic paper. There's actually a PowerPoint presentation I can, we can, you can download. And take a look at it. But 
Here's the effect. So if you're watching this on YouTube, um, to maximize profits, brands need to think both short-term direct response and long-term brand marketing. Now, in most cases, if we look at how we've operated as an agency, as a performance-driven agency, we pretty much have, up until about a year or so ago, operated in this sort of short-term sales activation cycle, meaning we're direct response. We want to spend a dollar. We want to get a dollar back as, as soon as possible. You know, in most cases, you know, a 3X ROAS. I don't know why that's like the magical number for so many businesses, but- well, I have but, an yeah. answer to that that we probably shouldn't talk about now, but it's probably worth an episode because it's an, it's an economic truth, not a marketing truth. Do tell. I would just try not to derail you, but basically 3X, <laughs> 3X is generally speaking where, uh, where A, a business- that's producing its own products is profitable and be where a business needs to be profitable in order to compete with the overarching market. It's why drop shippers got pushed out. Yeah. Um, 3X ROAS, and I hate ROAS as you know, but you know, 3X ROI, let's say, um, allows for um, the, the uh, necessary expenditure from a cost of good and marketing perspective in order to earn a client and still break even. So 3X ends up being just kind of the ubiquitous truth. And dude, it's almost across all industries. Some, really some very you know, distinct exceptions like supplements are you know, always high margin. But anything that has manufacturing and distribution involved, um, you're usually looking at a 3X row as before you break even. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. It's sort of a benchmark. I think that's uni it's a universal truth. Yep. And uh, you know, I mean, if your business is a two to one, you're never going to make it. And that's why dropshippers really can't compete on Facebook and, and Meta and probably not Google. anymore. They used to be able to, and traffic was so much cheaper. But absolutely, just, yeah. those days are gone. So, getting back to this study, so Les Bennett and Peter Field, uh, we learned uh, that sales activations, which is sort of these this blue line, this blue sort of jagged line that you see here, produced big short term effects. Like you can run a lot of traffic and a lot, you can get to a level of scale running website conversion campaigns, swapping out your creatives, doing creator content, UGC, doing all the tips and tricks like separating out your levels of traffic, enhancing your sales funnel, increasing your CRO, doing all that sort of stuff. You can do that. You can reach a level of scale using that on the meta platforms, doing high intent based keywords like in the personal injury niche you know, a car accident attorney, Scottsdale, Arizona, like there is a level of traffic and a level of scale, which you can achieve by going after those short term sales activations. Now, what Bennett and field found is that they're short term effects. They decay mm. quickly unless you continue to spend. There's no residual effect. It's like if you're running an ad and you're a PI lawyer and somebody clicks on your ad, there's really no brand, there's there's no long-term effects. All they're looking for is a solution in the here and now. And that prevents a business from scaling. Mm. The combination of the two is where the real sweet spot is. And that's what they really wanted to study. Like in theory, Bennett and Field said, okay, well, this in theory makes sense, but let's go out and test it. So they developed a framework for thinking about marketing effectiveness by looking at 996 campaigns, okay? This is through multiple platforms over 30 years. This oh, wow. predates like Google pay-per-click and, you know, meta ads for damn sure, yeah. covering over 700 brands in 83 different categories. And what they found is that the effect of brand building is much more longer term and it decays more slowly and they accumulate, it actually accumulates over time to drive long-term profit and growth. So if you're watching on YouTube, you can actually sort of see the effects of this. And so brand building in combination with activation or conversion campaigns start to produce long-term gains in sales but it also what it really impactful transition you just made ralph we can't we can't just glaze over that comparison between what happens between sales activation and brand building if you're not watching the sales activation is a muddy hill 
You climb up, you fall down, you climb up, you fall down, you climb up, you fall down, you climb up, you fall down. You never make any real progress. And then you compare that and it's a, it's a graphic that's overlaid to brand building, which is now a staircase and you climb up, 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 up one step at a time. Yeah. And this is what, you know, in the conference that I went to the performance marketing summit, they actually used examples of this and how do big brands like Allergan, like now athletic greens, um, you know, Kate Spade, like how do they scale? They don't do it by living down in, you know, best cosmetic uh, for rosacea keywords. Mm. Yeah, they do all that. They compete down here. But what they do really effectively is they build this stuff. And you can see the brand building sort of gains over time. They build their own individual unique brands so that what happens is that the long-term gains in sales actually reduces price sensitivity. You're no longer trying to compete against who's got the lowest price in that high intensity or or high intent-based keyword phrase world on Google or website conversions for your coaching program on Meta. You're competing against every other coaching program, not only people that are directly competing against you for your type of coaching, but every coach everywhere and Mm -hmm. all the personal development people. It's a bloody red ocean and you can only reach a certain level of scale with those types of campaigns. And the big brands realized this. And so Bonnet and, and Field, they did this study and they realized that brand building starts to outperform sales activation at a certain point in time. And they say it's about six months. So when we were talking to uh, a client of ours who spends millions on sales activation ads, both Google and on Facebook, they're like, we have reached a point where, and our team is really, really good at this, like really good at lowering their cost per acquisition, you know, scaling as much as we possibly can, Google and Facebook together, getting booking as many appointments as possible. We're using offline conversions, obviously, in their case to, you know, in their case, it's procedures sort of at the back end. There's a lot of ways in which you can build a business. It's a very successful business. Like they are an eight figure plus business, but they reach this level of scale where they reduce some costs, but they can't get to that next level until they do this Mm. and they realize it and they understand it. And they're a very mature a group of individuals who understand marketing and they understand really this study. They realize that the big brands don't muddle around in those lower echelons. Yes, they have the sales activation campaigns, but they combine it with brand building. And at a certain point, like I said, right around the six month mark, when you do both of these things together, all of a sudden, that's when you really start to, to, uh, you know, to scale. And we see it all the time in the personal injury law niche. So personal injury law is one of those, you know, bloody red ocean areas. And I've used that as an example here, but at a certain point, when we start to activate both brand building and high intent based keywords at about the three to six month range, all of a sudden the brand starts to drive a lot of the brand searches, trade name searches, product based searches that through awareness and through the top level campaigns, the awareness and consideration campaigns are now, they're the ones that are being Googled, Mm. all right? As opposed to the very competitive car accident attorney, Albuquerque, New Mexico keyword. Instead, they are now, they're now Googling the actual name of the law firm. And that's the reason why you see so many PI attorneys have billboards, do a lot with TV. They get this. The combination of the two is where the real sweet spot is. And if you really know what you're doing on the Google side, especially in that space and on the Facebook side, this is where it really comes together and you reach massive, massive scale. The only thing that I would challenge, not that I get to challenge because it's a 20 year study with, you know, multivariant factors, but the thing that I'd maybe buttress or just offer an anecdotal exception to is the six months. Mm -hmm. Because I feel like that might be for much larger brands with much bigger spends. I think for smaller companies, we probably need to hold the line a little bit longer. 
I feel mm. like, you know, when, when Solutions 8 started really investing in, in brand building, I don't feel like I got a tangible, measurable cons- return for the first year. And so for the CMOs and director of marketing, you know, if you're out there and you're spending less than hundred grand a month, which by the way, is, even that's not a lot, but I don't think anybody should look at a six month timeline and think like, oh, six months in a day, it didn't work. Um, I think that, you know, it's, it's time or money. If you can spend the money, then you don't need to spend the time. If you can't spend um, the money, then you have to spend the time. Yeah. Uh, that aside, I, dude, I'm with you. I think that this graphic should just be on the homepage of every marketing agency's website. Um, this is this is the approach that we have to take. I mean, it's it's you know we're talking about best practices. This is the prerequisite. Yeah, 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 hundred percent. And you know, one of the examples that Meta used was uh, the Allergan brand. They had two different brands. They had Botox and Juvederm. And what they found is that they reallocated their spend to conversion camp from solely conversion based campaigns to more of a balanced brand awareness, top of funnel consideration, which is basically an opt in or maybe for a coupon, something sort of mid funnel, a transitional call to action, not the ultimate call to action or the ultimate, uh, you know, event, which is purchasing the product. So, yeah. So what they found is that when Botox started switching from pure conversion campaigns to a little bit more activation, a little bit more on the brand awareness side and then the consideration side, they realized that it didn't work quite as well because they already had brand awareness. But for the Juvederm brand, it worked like magic because Juvederm didn't have the brand awareness. You needed brand awareness and you needed some consideration to slowly entice or at least introduce people to the brand. And that's where the sweet spot was. So yeah, well, and you can overdo it on the brand. I dude, I call this the Geico effect. I think Geico has destroyed their brand. (laughs) I I, I, dude, I think they're the way that they've just carpet bombed the, the the issue is it's, it's become white noise. Yeah. You know, you just do not pay attention anymore. Not only that, it's it's just kind of annoying. Um, so I think you can overdo it on the brand. I think that there's a healthy balance. The reason we're having this discussion is because really most people, it's it's 90-10 the wrong way. You know, it's 90 direct response, 10 brand building, and we need we need to be somewhere um in a in a more balanced arena. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't know what the exact percentage is, but for in this case, and take this with a grain of salt, because it's these are lar- much larger brands. All right, we are extrapolating large brand building activity to your business. You know, you might be a director of marketing with a, you know, with a couple hundred thousand dollar marketing budget and a multi million dollar business. The point is, is like we're comparing you to billion dollar brands here, so you have to sort of take that with a grain of salt. Like, where, what is the percentage mix? What Bennett and Field found is that it's about a 60-40 mix when all is said and done. Hmm. It's about 60% on brand building, 40% on activation. I don't know what the exact percentage is. And it's certainly for tier 11 clients, it's not that. It's much less. It's, you know, maybe 20 or 30 or 40%. And we'll actually see an example here in just a second of an actual, uh, you know, customer of ours where we broke down like, all right, brand awareness, consideration, action on their Facebook ad account and sort of figured out, okay, what buckets does does this fall into? So depending on your brand, depending on a lot of different things, there's a lot of variations here. And the point is of this whole exercise is for you to start thinking slightly differently about how you do things and how you market yourself online. So bottom line is this, so adding brand to your your mix accelerates the impact of your marketing. You get 100% greater reach Okay. You get greater organic search lift, okay, which makes sense. People are searching for you a whole lot more when they see these top level ads at a very high level brand awareness consideration phase, and you get incremental sales. That's the whole thing. Otherwise, we wouldn't really be talking about this. It was just brand building for brand building. Oh, just build brand and measure your impressions and your reach. And No, we're talking about like, is this moving the business forward? That's the difference between, I think, branding conversations we might have had in the past and brand building in concert with or in association with 
in a blended fashion, activation campaigns, which is conversion campaigns. And obviously there's brand lift that goes along with this. And these are all studies uh, where you obviously, you know, if you're doing brand awareness, obviously you're going to get brand lift. So it's sort of an obvious thing. One of the most important things, and, and we spoke to our uh, customer about this, and I, I felt it was a, an impactful slide, is that they're a publicly traded company. So they want to get to the level where they're one of these elite top brands, and they absolutely will get there because their product is so damn good. But there is a lot of big competitors in their space. So what do you do? Like, how do you do this? And they are very much on board with it because they're very forward thinking, especially the CMO is. And the point is, is that people who do this are businesses that, that have powerful brands, uh, you know, over, like overproduce. They, they uh, exceed not only the competition, but also the benchmarks that we have for growth in the stock market, which is the S&P 500. So powerful brands deliver stronger shareholder results, outperforms weaker competitors, as well as the S&P. And we see the S&P here, uh, powerful brands almost doubling the output as far as shareholder return goes than the S&P 500, just because they're doing this kind of brand building. Now, this is a, once again, this is a study from, uh, from Meta. It's this Kantar custom meta analysis. We'll leave links in the show notes for it. This, my but, only question here is how are they defining powerful brands? Like what are the parameters by which they've decided to, to you know, tranche these? And I'm, I'm, I'm not challenging them. I just think it would be really helpful to know it because that's how I, as a, as a, if I were a CMO, I'd want to reverse engineer this and say, okay, well, what, what makes a powerful brand? Yeah. We'll, uh, we'll leave links in the show notes to this, uh, this study here, the Brand Balancing Act um to answer that very question because i think that's a very good question mm -hmm. so we'll leave links in the show notes for that so the point is is like we're reinforcing the idea that brand is actually where you really want to go on all this all right so far we've talked about awareness consideration and conversion campaigns and what the difference is on those after the break we're going to get into a specific example for a tier 11 customer and show you that breakdown of exactly how they were using awareness, consideration, conversion. And it's actually not what you think. They were actually doing a lot better than we thought they were originally doing in the consideration phase. And we'll show you how we're changing that strategy moving forward right after this quick break. So this is an example. This is an example of one of the customers that we have right now and sort of where they're at and what their spend is. They Obviously, they spend a fair amount on, on Facebook. They spend a, a lot more on Google. But uh, if we sort of break down their last literally 60 days of spend, what we find is that they're actually doing a pretty good job. They actually have some consideration campaigns. But Here's how we kind of, this is where the rubber meets the road, especially if you're a meta advertiser is awareness is reach or brand awareness campaigns. And you test for things like recall and awareness and your targeting is typically very broad or very large lookalike audiences. So you're trying to hit as many people as possible uh, with this top of funnel, very, very, very top of funnel, not call to action, just helpful, useful content or to the type of content that is like the founder's story, like a tour of the facility, like how they do what they do and how they give back to the community, like really top of funnel ethereal kinds of ads were the ones that were shown in this presentation for, for Meta. What we're doing now is we're seeing, okay, that's great, but you can also actually make it a little bit more on the conversion side and it works equally well. That's where that case study that you can get over at tier11.com forward slash brand building uh, will show you exactly how we did this very thing. So reach awareness. Um, consideration is sort of that middle of funnel. Okay, this is where they're engaging. Maybe traffic clicking to the website. Maybe opting in for a coupon. Maybe opting in for some kind of lead magnet. You know, all the stuff that Ryan Dice taught us way back when. 
This is sort of a middle phase. This is not the ultimate conversion metric or the ultimate conversion event, but what it is, is it's a middle event. It's a transitional call to action in most cases. And in the case studies that, that you know, we've seen through Meta, we typically will see you know, coupon codes or you know, enter for a velvet rope kind of treatment or 20% off, that kind of thing in the e-commerce space. Oftentimes for us, it's just getting them to click to the website to read more about a specific case study that then all of a sudden at the very end, you know, has a potentially a call to action. So it's sort of a light call to action. Kobe talked about this in one of the previous episodes, and we'll leave links in the show notes for that as well, where it's a soft conversion. So consideration campaigns have, can have conversion as their objective, but it's typically, it's a soft conversion. It's a mm. page view. It's a, you know, add to cart is maybe a little bit too aggressive, but it's something sort of in between, you know, a landing page view, something where, yes, I've engaged, but I'm not really asking you to buy yet. Uh, and what we found is that in this particular customer, they were not using any awareness campaigns, which we're obviously going to switch, but they were using a fair amount of you know, some of their video content to send them to their, their specific, you know, page, their Instagram page or to their Facebook page. So it was a sort of a middle of funnel action. That's the reason why 21% of their ad spend is sort of in the consideration phase. And then the vast majority of stuff, everything that we're running, you know, in association with the consideration campaigns are just straight conversion campaigns, you know, do a video, uh, you know, a testimonial, UGC content, creator content, maybe even images, lots of retargeting, the whole traffic level of level one, two, three, four, five, going all the way to the purchase, like all that sort of classic conversion stuff with the measurement being conversion, return on ad spend, and some pretty hefty retargeting happening down uh, on that conversion level. So that's where it is today. The opportunity is to flip-flop that is maybe not to go 80-20 here with 80% being on awareness and consideration, but some kind of level of percentage where some of those conversion campaigns are now being utilized for top of funnel and for reach campaigns especially. And this is one of the most interesting things when I talked to one of the super sharp meta people at the conference is that when you do reach campaigns at very top of funnel, when you reach them and they engage, they then become a part of your conversion audience. So you could do like a 3% lookalike audience for you know your customer list. You can do a reach campaign for that 3%, and then you can do a conversion campaign for that 3%. And what happens is the more you spend on the reach campaign for that 3% lookalike audience, those people then convert and start becoming a part of your conversion campaign. Hmm. They actually are in both buckets, which for somebody like me and for media buyers, like this is a way to expand your market. You're now not just taking what Meta gives you, you're creating your own market. And we say this a lot on this show, the creative creates the audience. In this case, you're putting creative in front of an audience with a reach objective, and you are creating potential conversions as a result of that, which flips the whole sort of mindset around how you manage campaigns virtually on its head. Does that all make sense? Yeah. Yeah. I think this is a, this is a listen to it twice episode. So let's look at just a, this is just a nice quick example. Uh, I can't really show ad accounts for uh, customers here in presentation. This is, this is our ad account. So this is an ad account where we have been running video view campaigns for top of funnel, uh, top of funnel. And we also have bottom of funnel, which is conversion campaigns. And these are our conversion campaigns inside the tier 11 account. I forget what the look back period here is. Um, might be like three months or something like that. So you can see uh, you can see that the CPMs here are pretty expensive. These are all conversion campaigns. You see some dynamic creative uh, ads. You see some application ads, getting somebody to convert, fill out a form, book a call with our sales team, straight conversion campaigns. Look at how expensive our CPMs here 
are. Not only are you targeting cold traffic audiences, but you're also doing some a fair amount of retargeting. You can see that by level one, L2, L3. Like these are people that have engaged with us, but also we have it blended in with cold traffic audiences. It's it's expensive going website conversion. $79 CPMs. That's insanely high. Like that was eight cents an impression. I just did the math. Yeah. Yeah. That was $30. Probably when I looked at this data six months ago, it's almost doubled in the last six months. Wow. And that is how expensive costs are right now in the website conversion world. Now, compare that to another campaign, which we have running. Uh, and this is also historical. Uh, look at the CPMs for these video view sort of consideration awareness campaigns. Like these are straight line, no call to action, just video view campaigns of us teaching educational concepts about digital marketing, about customer acquisition, amplification, or whatever it happens to be. Like a lot of our methodologies, look at the difference in CPMs. We're looking at like two to $5 CPMs. And what we're then doing is we're creating the market. The more we spend on these types of ads, these types of campaigns, those then are fed into our conversion campaigns where you, know, you still are going to need conversion campaigns. But my point is, is if all you do is conversion campaigns at $80 CPM, you're going to quickly run out of audience You're going or quickly run out of cash. So the idea is combine, in this case, video view audiences, which is sort of a brand awareness slash consideration kind of campaign because we capture the audience based upon how much percentage of a video that they watch, whether it's something that I'm talking about, like maybe something like this. This might actually, this, this podcast might be one of those videos that we run at a certain point. The point is, is you're creating an audience for a fraction of the cost of what you would if you were running just straight conversion. Campaigns. Remind me, Ralph, what is, what is Facebook measure as an actual view with videos? And it, with YouTube, it's like 30 seconds. It's really so, long. With Facebook, it's, it's lower, isn't it? It used to be three seconds. Now it's 15 seconds. I mean, that's, a, that's, a, that's valuable. 15 seconds of a video, especially in like the thumb scroll TikTok world. You, yeah. You've gotten uh, 1,000 15-second views for $2.54. Yeah. Man, that, yeah. you know, it's like, would you pay $2.54 to show a thousand viable prospects your video? And another question is, is how good is your video? Yeah. Uh, I mean, some videos are better than others, right? you know? <laughs> you know? Uh, and so we optimize for that. I mean, we really do look at that. We sort of see, you know, from those video view campaigns, we'll see exactly which videos are resonating. And then we're like, all right, well, maybe we should create more content around that. Or maybe we should create a lead magnet around that. So, we first post it on our page, see what gets organically the most reach, the most engagement. And then we pull those best videos and then pull them into these video view campaigns. And uh, we're sort of reconfiguring a lot of this with some brand awareness stuff at the top. But the point is, is as soon as you get out of the website conversion arena, all of a sudden your costs start to decrease. And what you're going to notice is that you're going to start seeing more of your brand based search stuff become more relevant. If you don't have great organic SEO, you're going to need to run ads, uh, you know, for your brand. And you'll see that inside Tier Just go Google Tier 11 or Facebook ad agency, perpetual traffic, whatever it happens to be. You'll see our ads right there. And the reason is, is that we know that we're driving people naturally from a top of funnel engagement with a video view or brand awareness or a consideration type of campaign to learning more about what we do. And that's what we see in the personal injury niche. That's what we see in the case study. That's at tier11.com forward slash brand building. And that's what we're going to be doing for this uh, customer here. So when you start to add upper funnel to your mix, it, it accelerates the impact of your marketing. I think we actually showed this slide before, but just to reiterate the point that this is a big opportunity for marketers to really start thinking differently. Now, uh, this slide, especially if you're watching, uh, you know, on YouTube, I highly encourage you to get this uh, as well. Uh, Perpetualtraffic.com forward slash YouTube. We're throwing out a lot of URLs here, uh, Kasim. But this is an important slide because 
what what happens when you run a website conversion campaign is that let's say you're in a lookalike audience of a 1% lookalike audience for your buyers, your buyers who have bought from your last 90 days, which would be a great lookalike audience in the United States, you know, maybe the big six, whatever it happens to be. If you run a website conversion campaign, what Facebook will do is they will focus in on the people that are most likely to convert in that lookalike audience. Mm -hmm. So follow me on this one. So if let's say that audience you know, depending on what your age demographics are, what your country is, let's say it's a million person audience. Facebook will, or Meta, will focus on the percentage of people, which is maybe 1%, maybe 10%, maybe 5% of that million person audience who are most likely to convert based upon their previous behaviors. So let's say somebody in that audience, you don't use exclusions. You don't exclude people who have visited your website the last you know, 180 days. You don't exclude all of your customers from your customer database. You don't exclude people who have liked your page. You don't exclude people who have interacted with one of your videos and a video view audience. If you just go after that lookalike audience, Facebook will circle the wagons on the people that are most likely to convert. And a lot of times, those people that are most likely to convert are customers who have already bought from you. But at a certain point, you run out of those people in that audience, which means you then need to change up your front end creative, change up your messaging. You're in this constant battle where you're constantly shifting stuff out, which is, which is fine, which you should be doing. You should be freshening up your creative. If you run a creator content video that's been converting for a while in that lookalike audience of a million people, at a certain point, it, that performance is going to tail off. You will need to take and <laughs> revise that video, have new videos at the, at the ready Wait, maybe, maybe it's the same messaging or similar messaging. The point is Facebook circles the wagons on the people who are most likely to convert with a website conversion campaign. Not only the people that have already taken action that are similar to a conversion, but also people that look like those people. The big difference is, is as soon as you switch to the right, you can then create your audience. And all of a sudden now, it's not just this tiny group of individuals that Facebook will target. You will now expand your audience to people who had no idea who you were. And then they become a part of your website conversion audience. So attention doesn't discriminate between upper funnel brand and lower funnel performance. But the point is, is by doing this strategy, you're expanding your audience and not getting the same people over and over and over again. So by increasing the reach potential here and by using other audiences outside of just website conversions, the audience exhaustion and point of diminishing returns will be reached later and it will result in a more efficient spend. You'll basically have a longer runway as soon as you start combining conversion-based ads with brand awareness or brand or awareness and consideration campaigns, blending them together. And what we've seen, you know, in our case study is this is absolutely the case. So uh, this is yet another uh, meta slide here is that by combining multi-objective buying, that's the real key. So what you're doing is you're combining performance with website conversions, with reach and brand. So you're converting new customers in the long term, going back to the Bennett and Field slide, and you're getting additional sales through loyalty effects. And you can also start to command higher prices because you're just starting to build a brand. People will pay more because they recognize the brand. They recognize your level of quality. They recognize that you're different than everybody else. They recognize that you're not just one of those other clicks that are below all the other clicks when they search a high intent based keyword, like personal injury lawyer, Brookline, Massachusetts, or whatever it happens to be. When you start to build brand alongside that, you stand out and they see your name in those searches and they're more likely to click. And then they're also more likely to search for you specifically and look for you as opposed to the competition because you've built this brand equity with these you know, much higher level awareness and consideration campaigns. And not to be neglected, 
is that you have to convert users that are in the market. You absolutely do need conversion campaigns. One of our media buyers asked me, Kasim, you know, does this spell the end for conversion campaigns? Absolutely not. Uh, conversion campaigns are still going to be needed, but they will be a lower percentage overall than the total ad spend. Right now, if, if we did an analysis on maybe a lot of our accounts, a lot of these are now are converting over to this new strategy. Uh, so it's probably a little bit different. Let's say a year ago, like we were at Meta and we looked at two of our largest customers and they were 95% conversion campaigns, which is, which is crazy to think about it now. Now they're, you know, about 70%, 30% brand in consideration. So we've shifted that. And as a result of that, we've used that Bennett and Fields sort of uh, scale lower left hand corner, upper right hand corner, and really started to scale these businesses. And by the way, that's the case study that we have over at tier11.com forward slash brand building. So performance campaigns, short term sale campaigns aren't going to go away. Like, you know, you, your, your high intent keyword based campaigns on Google aren't going to go away. We're just going to, they're going to be far more efficient with this, with this strategy. And that's really what uh, the big difference is. So if you can unlock the value of, of these campaigns together, that's when you really start uh, being able to scale. And so on this slide, hopefully you're watching it on YouTube, uh, perpetualtraffic.com forward slash YouTube, uh, you can unlock the value of multi-objective buying on media by focusing on one objective. It could mean you're leaving a lot of opportunity on the table. And what they did is that in this study, and we'll leave links to this study as well, is that they studied brands who used brand and consideration campaigns alone, but not performance. And uh, just the combination of brand and consideration increased gains in effectiveness or increased their sales by 22%. They did the same thing with a combination of a couple of the other objectives and the gains were anywhere between 22% and 11%. And when you only used one specific type of campaign. And one of the examples is just performance only, which I know a lot of listeners of the show are doing right now. You're just using website conversion campaigns. The, the study showed that there was a drop off in performance of almost 11% uh, when it comes to return on ad spend. So the bottom line is this, is considering using different campaign objectives that blend together to ultimately produce the results that you're looking for for scale. And the way that we do it is through sort of this customer acquisition amplification system, uh, which you can actually see sort of the visual of it on the slide here, where we actually have awareness, consideration, and conversion under our traffic harmonizer system. So really start to consider using brand awareness, consideration, like video view campaigns. If you've got great videos that are posting on your page, your social team is posting them on your page for Facebook, for example. Go over to your meta business suite, scroll down to your business manager and go into this little section under home notifications, planner, content. Click on content and see what content is actually engaging with your audience the most. Those are the types of pieces of content that you might wanna consider using at top of funnel for these brand awareness type of campaigns. Or maybe there's some images, maybe there's some postings that you've done in the past. Go back through it. I think it defaults to the last 90 days inside content. We'll leave a link uh, as how to get that. So that's the content tab inside Ads Manager, inside your meta business suite, pretty easy to navigate over on the left-hand side. And then see what kind of content is resonating. You know, see how much reach you got because this is all, remember, everything that you produce on your page, especially for Meta, or you could do the same sort of thing for Instagram, is it's being shown to your fans. It doesn't go any further than that unless it goes viral for one way, shape, or form, which is unlikely to happen. But like you'll see clearly which types of content, which pieces of content are the ones that resonate with your fans. That could be a good indication of a piece of content that you might want to put into a brand awareness or a consideration type of campaign that will then start to deploy this strategy. And I'm not talking about a thousand dollars a day here to start, like start with a couple, 
like $10 a day, $20 a day, whatever your budget can afford, but at least start doing this, capture those audiences. Okay. If it's a video view audience, that's considered sort of a consideration campaign. If it's maybe an image or an article, or, you know, maybe something about the company, put a brand awareness campaign objective behind it, see what kind of play you get there. All, and and you'll see your conversion campaigns start to really work even more effectively. And I'll, we'll show you exactly how we did it inside Tier 11 uh, in our case study for one of our customers. That's tier11.com forward slash brand building, all one word, forward slash brand building. Like I said, we'll leave links in the show notes. So hopefully that will help you in... Uh, looking at this whole thing a little bit differently. I know, Kasim, you said this is this is a new age of marketing. It really is. It's really it's a new way of looking at the same stuff that we did before. It's this new era for growth. And I think if you don't evolve as a media buyer, you're going to be left behind. If you're just going to be battling it out in website conversions or battling it out in high intent based keywords on Google. It's, it's a game that is not going to allow you to scale. And that's what this strategy is really all about. And, uh, we've seen it very, very effectively. And, you know, thanks to the folks at meta for sort of waking it us up to realize, all right, well, this is something that is a thing for the bigger brands. We were already doing it. Thankfully now we're doing it for all of our customers and we're seeing tremendous results. So, uh, all of this, uh, that we mentioned here today can be, found over in the show notes over at perpetualtraffic.com. Make sure that you do subscribe and leave a rating wherever you're listening. Let us know what we can do better at perpetualtraffic.com forward slash better. You can follow me on LinkedIn, Ralph Burns on LinkedIn and Kasim over on Twitter at, at Kasim Aslam. Go back and listen to previous episodes. Like I said, check out our YouTube channel if you're not watching already over at perpetualtraffic.com forward slash YouTube. We've gotten a lot of great feedback about that for episodes just like this, where we can really help you to uh, scale and grow your business, doing it a little bit more visually through presentations like this. And obviously YouTube is a great place to, to go for that. So perpetualtraffic.com forward slash YouTube. We'll leave all the links in the show notes at perpetualtraffic.com. On behalf of my awesome co-host, Kasim Aslam. Peace. Until next show, see ya. This idea of full funnel marketing is something that we're very excited about here at Tier 11. We've slowly been transitioning our clients away from being solely focused on conversions and building their brands long term. And if that is something that you are interested in for your brand, head over to tier11.com, hit the big pink button, and we'd love to chat with you about expanding your brand beyond the audience that you currently have and building its long term success. Mm -hmm.